One, two, one. 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 Good.
So we begin by lighting our chalice, reminding us of the Unitarian Universalism that flows through the past and into the present moment. Welcome, everybody, to the first Unitarian Universalist Society of San Francisco, a place that's been the home to the liberal heart since 1850, in a sanctuary that's the third for this congregation to occupy, dedicated in 1889. The ministry here most formatively shaped by Thomas Starr King, who served here from 1860 to 1864, saving California for the Union, and dying at 39, like other great martyrs of the civil rights movement in our country's history, having secured just that. We are here so happy to be hosting and co-sponsoring this event, co-sponsoring both with the Men's Committee of Boston and the Star King School of the Ministry. Because our connections go deep and wide tonight. First, of course, is the legacy of holding our progressive and Unitarian Universalist values up for review. The ongoing challenge to our inheritance that is forever the heretic's journey. It's one reason we're happy to host tonight's lecture. Asking how our values speak to the present moment that is very much a part of the arc of these lectures and our constant challenge. And there are other connections that thread through tonight. The men's lecture was endowed by a member of the First Church in Boston where I did my internship under the late Reverend Dr. Reese Williams. Former men's lecturers include now retired Minister David Keyes, who is a member here, and the late Reverend Victor Carpenter, who passed away last year, but served here from 1998 1988 to 1993. The Reverend Dr. Colin Boston, who is our lecturer tonight, is not only a beloved colleague, but was a member here before going to seminary. Personally, I am thrilled to share the days with Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt, the president of the Star King School of the Ministry. Rose and I both started new ministries in the New York area at the same time, in August of 2001, just a month before two planes struck the Twin Towers. And we were thrown into ministries, the pain and the demands of which we could not imagine. The trauma response ministry that she and others created in response to those events is still, I would say, one of the gifts that was rent from the ashes of that time that shows up now when asked wherever tragedy strikes and people need help finding a way through. Finally with us is Dr. Anthony Pinn, a professor at Rice University in Houston. From the great state of Texas where my father was raised and which cannot be left out of any magnetic pull of power centers. <laughs> so tonight we have the confluence of Boston, King's Chapel and First Church, New York, Texas and California weaving through this hour, these couple of hours of Unitarian Universalist happening. So thank you all for coming. Thanks to everyone who's joining us via the webcast from across the country. Welcome to the second lecture of the 2019 Men's Lecture Series. I would like to invite now Bill Kuttner from the Men's Committee 
to begin our evening. And when he's done, Rosemary Bray McNatt will introduce our speakers. Welcome. So thank you, Vanessa. Say, my name is Bill Kuttner. I'm a member of King's Chapel. The, um, uh, the men's the lectureship committee that organizes this consists of members from King's Chapel and, um, and First Church in Boston. And the reason is of uh, those two is that uh, Susan Mins, was, uh, who, uh, whose bequest is funding this, uh, it was a descendant of John Wilson, who was the first minister of First Church in Boston. And she was actually a member of King's Chapel. Uh, but I can understand why people, she was actually quite amazing. So you can see why people were, were, were fighting to, to uh, arguing to take, take a claim for her. So anyway, that's sort of the structure of the, of the committee. And uh, let, me, but I, let me tell you a little bit about Su Susan Mintz. She, um, she died in, in uh, 1938 at the age of 98. And um, the, the, the actual committee was set up in 1941, and then the first lecture started in 1942, and then going constantly. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but she um, uh, she went to MIT, and she was a published naturalist, and she was one of the charter members of the um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute right, back in the 1800s. So you, you so you can see why people would want to uh, claim this quite quite remarkable quite remarkable woman. So, uh, but in her bequest, she, she had two, two requirements for this uh, uh, lecture series. First of all, it had to be a Unitarian minister in, well, that we say, Unitarian Universalist minister in good standing. <laughs> I think we're okay. And, and second, it had to be a topic on um, general religious interest. Well, if the first lecture is, is any indication, I, I can personally assure you that you are going to hear a, a, a talk of, uh, of religious interest. So you're, 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 in, for, you're in for a treat. And since, uh, since 1942, these lectures, there's either been one or two, sometimes two speakers per year, we, we, uh, pretty regularly, and we have had um, uh, the leading thinkers in the denomination. However, most of them have been from the uh, Boston area, such as uh, uh, Dr. James Luther Adams, professor at Harvard Divinity School, and um, uh, so tend to be the Boston crowd. However, uh, with prudent management of our endowment, we've, we've had a little more resources and we started be bringing people from around the country to give lectures in Boston, like um, uh, Mark Morrison Reed uh, spoke last year on the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. He gave a series of three, three lectures, but they were all in the Boston area. Uh, this year, we decided we wanted to go on the road, so we had the first lecture in Boston, and the second, the second lecture is here, and the third will be at the General Assembly. Okay, show of hands, who's gonna go to the General Assembly? Yeah, okay, half of you put your hands up. I am not surprised. And the respondent will be the president of the nomination, uh, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray. So the, the, we're, this is an this is uh, important program. And the last thing before I um, wind up my talks is do check our website. It's called Men's Lectures. I guarantee your search, your search engine will not find anything vaguely resembling Men's Lectures because then shortly, You'll be able to click, and you'll be able to hear the first the first lecture, which was which was given to us a couple weeks ago. So, that is uh, those are my comments. Enjoy your evening. Good evening, everyone, and a special hello to those of you who are on the live stream. I am the Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt, and it is my honor to serve as president of Star King School for the Ministry, our Unitarian Universalist and multi-religious congregation, or not congregation, but um, seminary, in Berkeley, California. In some ways, we are a little congregation, actually, 106 wonderful students, half of whom are Unitarian Universalist, and half of whom are religious practitioners across the spectrum and we work together and study together and learn together. 
And I hope that if you don't know much about Star King, you'll go online and look us up and take a look at what we do. It is an honor to be able to introduce these two men who have had quite a bit of influence on contemporary Unitarian Universalist thought. The men's lecture is a wonderful place for them to do their work. And in fact, the men's lecture series has provided a lot of really important thinking over the past few years about Unitarian Universalism and its place in the world. I have been a respondent a couple of times and have enjoyed that experience, and so I look forward to this talk this evening. Speaking first is the Reverend Dr. Colin Bosson, who currently serves as the interim senior minister of the First Unitarian Universalist Church in Houston, Texas and as an African-American Religious Studies Forum affiliate with Rice University Center for Engaged Research and Collaborative Learning. Colin has a PhD in American Studies from Harvard University, where his work focused on the relationship between theology and populism, and a Master of Divinity degree from Meadville Lombard Theological School. Colin was one of the founders of the Harvard Graduate Students Union, he maintains a long-time affiliation with the Radical Labor Union, the Industrial Workers of the World, and for more than a decade worked with indigenous movements in Chiapas, Mexico. He's the author of two religious education curricula and close to three dozen published essays, articles, book chapters, and poems. Responding to Colin will be the Reverend Dr. Anthony Pinn, Anthony received his Master of Divinity and PhD in the study of religion from Harvard University and currently serves as the Agnes Cullen Arnold Professor of Humanities and Professor of Religion at Rice University in Houston, Texas. Penn also is the founding director of the Center for Engaged Research and Collaborative Learning at Rice, as well as director of research for the Institute for Humanist Studies in Washington, D.C. His research interests include humanism and hip-hop culture, African-American religious culture and theological thought, and humanism. The author or editor of more than 35 books, he also serves our movement on both the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee and the Panel on Theological Education. So I get a chance to talk to Anthony like a couple times a year. Without further ado, the Reverend Dr. Colin Bosson. Before I begin, I'd like to thank you all for coming out this rainy uh, Saturday evening or listening online. I'd also like to thank the Men's Lecture Committee for the invitation to give these lectures on American populism and Unitarian Universalism. Special thanks goes to the Reverend Vanessa Southern and the First Unitarian Universalist Society of San Francisco for hosting this section, second lecture and for Star King School for the Ministry for co-hosting. I decided to enter the ministry when I was a member here in the late 90s. The congregation both supported my candidacy for the ministry and provided me with a gener generous scholarship to attend seminary. So it's a special pleasure to be with you all tonight. I also want to thank Dr. Anthony Pinn for agreeing to serve as my respondent. And as among his many other roles, Dr. Pinn directs Rice University's Center for Engaged Research and Collaborative Learning, and I'm proud to be an African-American Religious Studies affiliate with that program, with that center. I'm grateful for the support the center has given me alongside the congregation I currently serve, the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston, as I prepared these lectures. A few quick acknowledgments before I continue. 
I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my parents, Howard and Kathy Bosson, as well as my son, Asa Bosson, my doctoral advisor, Myra Riviera Riviera, my dear friend, Dr. Wendy Salkin, who served as the respondent to my first lecture in Boston, my co-author and friend, Julia Hamilton, my longtime co-conspirator, Roxanne Rivas, and my old friend, mentor, and comrade, Neil McLean, whose thinking continues to influence mine. Without your support, none of this would be happening. I wish to acknowledge that we stand lonely land. It's important to remember where we are. And finally, I want to dedicate this lecture to the memories of both the Reverend Kay Jorgensen and Dick Castile, longtime members of this congregation and pillars of San Francisco civil society. My talk this evening contains some disturbing raci racist language and concepts, as well as dated racial words. I'm devoted to the analytical work of dismantling white supremacy. What I'm presenting to you is offered in that vein. I apologize in advance for bringing the thoughts of avowed racists into the room. I believe that if white supremacy is to be dismantled, it must be understood, and understanding it means understanding it on its own terms. With that, the social question, Unitarian social ethics in the progressive era. You called, you called us rowdies, eh? Those were the last words that the Reverend Ethelred Brown heard before him be, being knocked unconscious by a blackjack. It was January 1928. Brown was serving as the minister of the Harlem Community Church, the congregation he had founded eight years earlier. Marcus Garvey, the leader of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, also known as UNIA, had been deported back to his home country of Jamaica a scant month prior. His deportation, deportation followed his release from prison after his conviction for mail fraud. In response, Brown and his congregation hosted a debate under the advertised and ill-advised title, The Deportation of Marcus Garvey, a study in guilt, spite, and leadership. Garvey's followers showed up to the evening's discussion in force. Their attendance should not have surprised Brown. A number of them were members of the congregation. Brown and one of community church's most important lay leaders, W.A. Domingo, in fact, had been early supporters of Garvey. In Brown's case, he had served as a, the assistant treasurer of the Black Star Line Corporation, a shipping line organized by Garvey as part of his Back to Africa strategy for a brief period before becoming disillusioned with his fellow Jamaicans' bitter anti-white propaganda. Brown felt that Garvey's views were diametrically opposed to his Unitarian theology. As for Domingo, he was the founding editor of the Negro World. The newspaper started to support what became known as the Garveyite movement and had edited it for about a year before the two men had a bitter following out. The issue had been Domingo's socialism. He proclaimed a Christian version which held socialism as an economic doctrine is merely the pure Christianity preached by Jesus. In the atmosphere of the 1919 Red Scare, Garvey felt that this position imperiled his organization and forced Domingo to resign. The conflict that erupted at the Harlem Community Church was one of several between progressives and populists during the first decades of the 20th century. In the years immediately following World War I, a number of populist movements emerged in the United States and elsewhere as a result of progressives' inability to deliver on their promises for social reform. In the lead up to the war, war, progressives had declared that its termination would bring about a new social order or a new world in its wake. Yet despite such declarations and Pred President Woodrow Wilson's own pledge that the war's conclusion would culminate in the ultimate peace of the world, economic, political, and social structures remained largely unchanged. One of Garvey's supporters offered perhaps the most succinct description of the relation between the unfulfilled promises of progressives and the rise of populism. Writing in August 1920, as Garveyism reached its crescendo, the prominent Garveyite William Ferris observed that after the United States had declared war on Germany, 
many black people went into hysterics of joy. They thought that Wilson's declared intention to make the world safe for democracy meant that the millennium had come. It had not. Instead, white violence against people of color increased, and they were, quote, disenfranchised, Jim Crowed, segregated, and lynched, as in days of yore. When established leaders such as the, like the progressives W.E. Du Bois and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People failed to transform society, a large number of black people turned to Garvey's populist Universal Negro Improvement Association. It was quickly transformed into what scholars have described as the most important phenomena, one of the most important phenomena in the history of the African diaspora. Both populism and progressivism are varieties of political ontology that are devoted to reforming or altering social relations. Ontology is the study of the nature of being. My definition of the political is simple. It's how any group of two or more people attempt to organize the social relations between themselves and other beings, human or otherwise. Different political ontologies signify the variety of politics that political actors wish to create. Populists seek to create a people in the hopes of constituting a new political community that will bring about a rapid and fundamental shift in social structures, what might be called a revolution. Progressives are more gradualist in their approach. Instead of focusing on crafting collective identity, they seek social reform through the transformation of state regimes. Populism and progressivism are often intertwined. Populist movements tend to arise when there is widespread disappointment with the promises of progressives following a real or perceived crisis. When populist movements form, they counterpose, critique, and sometimes even combat progressives. Like the early 20th century, our contemporary moment is one in which populist and progressive moment, movements have again come into conflict. My men's lectures are an exercise in social ethics that are trying to draw lessons from historical encounters between populists and progressives to inform the actions of Unitarian Universalists today. Theological discipline of social ethics arose in the late 19th century. It stemmed from the progressive idea that the mission of religion is to transform the structures of society in the direction of social justice. Its founding figure was the Harvard professor and Unitarian minister Francis Greenwood Peabody, who believed that the social question of how society was to be structured was at the bottom an ethical question. Following his lead, at its point of origin, social ethics sought to bring an explicitly ethical Christian dimension to the then emerging disciplines of the social sciences. Objecting to what he perceived to be the abstract orientation of moral philosophy, Peabody envisioned a discipline devoted to tackling specific moral problems and moving from observing actual social conditions to making specific claims for ethical action. Just as in physics, we now go from earth to heaven and not reversed, he wrote, describing his intended method and his scientific aspirations for the discipline. Today, social ethics blends insights from the humanities, social sciences, and theology to guide the actions of its pr practitioners and by extension influence religious communities. My own approach to social ethics marries careful archival work with a hermeneutics drawn from political philosophers and liberal and liberation theologians. Hermeneutics might be recast as interpretation. In both biblical and historical studies, it is how we attempt, in the words of one of its theorists, to overcome the certain strangeness of the past and build a bridge between the once and the now. My hermeneutics is decidedly presentist, a choice which I'm sure makes many historians uncomfortable. Here I might rework a line from Karl Marx. He said, philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. The purpose of my historical work is not merely to understand the past, it's to help change the world. Archival work and analysis helps us to understand how the world we came in to be, inhabit came into being the range of choices available to previous generations of political actors, and how their choices might help us to think creatively about our own options. 
If political ontology is how various political agents attempt to constitute the political, then history helps us to understand how those agents have succeeded and failed in creating various political situations that prevail throughout the world. The great hermeneutical philosopher Hans George Gadamer observed, the horizon of our past, out of which our culture and present live, influences in everything we want, hope for, or fear in the future. Political systems, like other human constructs, such as economic class, gender, and race, are not natural structures arising from immutable laws of nature. They've been created by people across time. My emphasis on political ontology comes from an observation that the political not only is an effort to create certain kinds of being, but that political systems have come into being. In my investigation of political ontology, I'm focusing on two particular issues, sovereignty and the relationship between the state and violence. I've chosen these issues because combating today's white supremacist populism is my central concern. These issues are of significant interest to white supremacist populists like President Donald Trump and his pet ideologue, Russell Miller. The two issues might be cast as questions. Sovereignty, who gets to make decisions about how social, structure, about how social relations will be constructed? The state's relationship to violence. Who will the state protect from violence? Who is subjected to the state's violence? And on whose behalf? behalf will the state exercise violence. White supremacist populists like Donald Trump have clear answers to these questions. For them, sovereignty is exclusively the domain of men who believe themselves to be white. The state, in their view, is organized to enact violence on the bodies of brown and black people in an effort to extract labor from workers and, from, and resources from the land. The state also functions to protect these white supremacist populists from any potential violence that might be used to resist white supremacist populism. Progressives are frequently unfocused in, in their attempts to answer questions of on either sovereignty or the state's relationship to violence. Today, the political party in power is almost wholly captured by white supremacist populists. The opposing political party is largely a creature of progressives. Historically, the fuzziness of progressives on sovereignty and state violence has left them ill-equipped to either counter or cooperate with any variety of populism. If Unitarian Universalists and other variety of religious leftists are to be effective in either, to quote Mark Hicks, building the world we dream about, or resisting the white supremacist populism of the Trump regime, then we must move beyond progressive political ontology, imagine new ways of being political, and develop clearer understandings of our relationship to sovereignty and the state's relationship to violence. In my first lecture, I traced the lineage of the current president of the United States white supremacist populism back to the presidency of Andrew Jackson. I argued that the genocidal project of Indian removal was at the heart of Jacksonian populist efforts to create a people. It entailed the casting out of the indigenous nations, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Cree, and the Seminole from the political community of the United States, the seizure of their lands for settlers of European descent, and the repurposing of those lands for chattel slavery and cotton plantations. I offered a definition of white supremacy, contending that it is best understood as a claim that the real and imagined rights and needs of men who believe themselves to be white should be prioritized over other beings, human or otherwise. And I argued that progressive political ontologies held by the Unitarians, John Quincy Adams, John Calhoun, and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Margaret Fuller were white supremacist in nature and insufficient to counter or combat the genocidal project of Indian removal. In the second lecture, I will continue my account of conflicts between populist and progressive political ontologies. I will focus on two, progress two Unitarian progressives, the Afro-Caribbean and Harlem-based minister Ethelred Brown and the Anglo-American social ethicist Francis Greenwood Peabody, and their critiques of and struggles with two populist movements, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, commonly known as UNIA, and the Industrial Workers of the World, also known as the IWW or the Wobblies. In my first lecture, I was wholly critical of Jacksonian white supremacist populism. In the second lecture, I'll offer a new, more nuanced perspective on both the IWW and UNIA. 
As subaltern movements, their varieties of populism open up possibilities for collective liberation. They also contained within them more than hints of what Joanne Braxton has called organic universalism. She's defined this as a theological tradition that resists the division of humanity into the saved and the damned and is concerned with the salvation of all souls, all beings. Each in their own fashion, the IWW and the UNIA cast organic universalist visions that sought to empower the historically disenfranchised and dispossessed while pronouncing visions of global community. In addition, they blended their populism with a prefigurative approach to political ontology. Populism and progressivism are both political ontologies that are future-oriented. They look forward to the realization of a different state of social relations than the ones that currently exist. In contrast, pre prefig in contrast, in prefigurative ontologies, the future is now, means cannot be separated from ends, and what its adherents are required to act as if one is already free. Or, as the Wobblies put it in the preamble to their constitution, they hope to form the structure of the new society within the shell of the old. And now, with that scholarly throat clearing out of the way, we return to the evening on January, in January 1928 when the Reverend Ethelred Brown was hit on the head with a blackjack. The injury was bad enough to send him to the Harlem Hospital. For weeks afterwards, he was required to wear a bandage under his hat. Brown probably should not have been surprised that he had received his head wound. Since you and I's reformation a decade prior, more than a few of Garvey's critics had met with intimidation, physical violence, and at least in one case, assassination. Nonetheless, Brown seems to have under, been undeterred in his desire to both critique Garvey from the pulpit and offer Garvey's supporters the opportunity to respond. The evening's format was an innovative experiment stemming from Brown's humanistic vision for his congregation. It was uncommon for Unitarian churches, unless they were on the radical humanistic edge, to have public discussions after the preacher's remarks. The night's liturgy was inspired by the stated mission of the Harlem Community Church to serve as a forum and a temple. This meant it was a place where we worship the true and good and beautiful and receive inspiration to live a life of service, while at the same time offering a space where mind sharpens mind as we strive to plumb the depths, span the breadth, and scale the heights of knowledge. In keeping with its mission statement, in Brown's congregation, the rational was viewed as the highest good in religion. Properly applied, the Unitarian minister believed reason led to freedom. As Brown put it, religion is an emancipatory power. It, it frees us from the shackles of theology, which are both unreasonable and dogmatic, and from creeds which never change. As the passage reveals, Brown's religiosity was primarily expressed in free inquiry in pursuit of religious truths. Such a view is suggestive of progressive ontology. Religious thought, it implies, is supposed to change over time, not hold static, and as it shifts, it should reach ever greater heights. It signified, in Brown's words, building a modern church for a modern age. Creating religious community for such an age meant that the pursuit of rationality in religion took precedence over either community membership or emotional experience. The lack of emphasis on either emotional connection or group belonging might help explain why the congregation never grew beyond a few dozen members, despite the stature that Brown and his con and congregants like Domingo enjoyed in Harlem, and an attendance that could sometimes number a few hundred. On that January evening, Brown offered a full-throated critique of Garvey that ran almost three quarters of an hour. He began by telling the gathered congregation of Garvey supporters and critics alike, while I do not approve of deportation as such, I heartily approve of Marcus Garvey's deportation. Brown's statement was in many ways an odd utterance from a man who was an outspoken critic of police violence and who had condemned the state of Massachusetts for the legal lynching of Italian-born anarchists Nicola Sacco and Bartolomo Vanzetti. But in his view, Garvey's recent imprisonment and expulsion were better for Americans in general and the Negro in particular because he was a bombastic, conceited, and arrogant individual who sought his own self-aggrandizement rather than genuine social justice. The Unitarian minister's reasons for criticizing Garvey were not unlike those of his fellow progressives, 
W.E. Du Bois and A. Philip Randolph. Du Bois thought Garvey a demagogue and called him the most dangerous enemy of the Negro race in America and the world, whose efforts blended dream, fact, fancy, and wish. The socialist and labor organizer Randolph had stated that Garvey's romantic and infantile excursions would set back the clock of Negro progress. As for Brown, he agreed with other progressive leaders that Garvey was not personally fit to be a great leader and that the Black Star Line, his stupendous program of redeeming Africa, was a masterstroke in propaganda that had crashed on the shores of reality and ended in an expensive failure. After informing his listeners that Garvey's efforts were nothing more than impossible promises, he told them that people who followed his former associate were tools, not men. The Garveyites in the audience did not take Brown's inflammatory criticism of either them or their leader well. After the Unitarian minister finished speaking, he opened the floor to public discussion. A UNI leader named Abdul Krim then spoke for 20 minutes. When Brown suggested that he might limit his comments so that others might speak, the Garveyites decided to leave the meeting in mass. As they approached the door, Garvey made the injudicious remark to the remaining gathering, now that the rowdies are gone. Brown's comment is revealing to the preconditions necessary for the kind of dialogue he thought, sought to create. Political opponents or people with discordant views needed to commit to moral suasion and refrain from physical force or violence in their attempts to win arguments. It was an almost incoherent position for someone who applauded the use of state violence to remove Gar Garvey from the political community of the United States. And so it might not be that surprising that after Brown made his incautious comment, something like pandemonium erupted. One of the Garveyites made a grab for the collection plate, crying, and we give him a big collection too. When she was stopped by two of the congregation's lay leaders, Brown grabbed the plate and tried to slip out the rear door. He made his way into the anteroom only to discover that it was already occupied. He was promptly beamed on the head and sent to the hospital. In Mark Morrison Reed's view, the conflict between the Garveyites and Brown was primarily about intellectual freedom, and the principal value of the Harlem Unitarians was intellectual inquiry and dialogue. Other major interpreters of Brown, such the, the other major interpreter of Brown, Juan Floyd Thomas, makes a similar argument in his analysis of the event, observing that it was organized in the spirit of promoting an open exchange of ideas. In his analysis, Mark Morrison Reed makes little of the substantive differences in Brown and Garvey's beliefs. Instead, he observes the connection between religion and politics that the Harlem Unitarian Church often made was frequently not a harmonious union. The idea that a nonviolent exchange of ideologies is desirable or even possible requires a particular political viewpoint. As Hannah Arendt observed, and recent events in Syria and elsewhere have proven all too true, when nonviolent movements meet political systems without good reason for their restraint, the result is not social transformation, but massacre and submission. In order for anything like free inquiry to take place, an entire intellectual scaffolding prioritizing rationality and moral suasion has to be erected. It would be ahistorical to believe such scaffolding is widely shared across the United States. As I detailed in my first men's lecture, white supremacist populists like Andrew Jackson and John Donald Trump do not care about it at all. Brown's interpretation of the relation between Unitarianism, tolerance, and freedom of belief was on full display earlier in 1923 when he gave another sermon about Garveyism. He delivered it shortly after Garvey had been sentenced to a five-year prison sentence for mail fraud. In the sermon, Brown struck out for the middle road and invoked the progressive desire for social peace when he told his congregation that he wanted to approach the Garvey movement between two fires as neither a fanatic defender of Garvey nor a bitter enemy. He was afraid that Garvey would destroy the harmony of this little family, the Harlem Community Church, because the congregation contained both some of Garvey's supporters and some of his fiercest critics. In seeking to keep the peace between the factions, Brown pled to our members to be liberal to the limit of their liberalty. Such liberalism, he told his flock, was central to a religious community 
that allowed its members, as it encouraged its minister, to express fearlessly my political, social, theological, and philosophical questions. Brown then proceeded to critique Garvey on much the same lines he would five years later. Despite Brown's plea, the populist-inclined Garveyites were not interested in an open exchange of ideas. They wanted to defend their ideology and then impose it upon others. While there's no record of what the Garveyites said, said during their debate with Brown, it's easy to imagine that it was similar to the words that Garvey himself had for his opponents. He called them traitors and accused them of selling out to the leaders of the white race. He also attacked them, singling out Du Bois for being men placed in the highest education and society. These elites, Garvey claimed, were out of touch with the lives of most black people. In her biography of Garvey, Amy Jock Garvey, his second wife, stated the dynamic. She summarized the NAACP as an organization directed by white people and one colored man and described Du Bois as someone who had been brought up in the comparatively cultured atmosphere of Massachusetts by good white people and who continued to be sponsored by them. On first blush, this caustic language is not dissimilar from the rhetoric that Brown, Du Bois, and others used when they attacked Garvey. On closer inspection, differences begin to emerge. Garvey connected, critiqued the progressives because they were disconnected elites. The progressives, in contrast, went after Garvey because they viewed him as a dangerous demagogue whose charismatic propaganda and impossible promises beguiled the gullible. The distinction is actually ontological. In their construction of a people, the populace purport to represent the will of that people. Implicitly, they follow the teachings of the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau that a community, a people, is able to join together around an uh, issue or position and then enforce their common interest. In the case of Garveyites, the will was embodied in Garvey himself, whose followers often called our Moses or occasionally even compared to Christ. In other populist movements, such as the IWW, the people's will is found incarnate in the organization itself. When asked what the union was, its organizers would sometimes reply, well, we did not create it. The workers did. As near as I can get it, it is a communal organization. In contrast, for progressives, there is no distinct will of the people. In general, they hold such metaphysical grounding to be suspect and instead think of human knowledge as contingent, gained through experience, and through the use of science ever increasing. Of the incident, Morrison Reed observe, has observed that it reveals there was a strong political element incorporated into the religious life of the Harlem Unitarian Church. To both contemporary Unitarian Universalists and contemporaneous Unitarians, this interlacing of religious, religion and politics would not have seemed abnormal. The largest ch Unitarian Church in New York City at the time was Community Church of New York. Its commitment to the blending of religion and politics was so wholehearted that at the time, it was taking a break from the American Unitarian Association because its senior minister, John Haynes Holmes, had been expelled from the association for adopting a pacifist position during the war. He had done so in opposition to the AUA's then lay president, former president and future Supreme Court justice, or chief justice of the Supreme Court, William Howard Taft. Taft represented the dominant wing of Unitarianism, while Holmes led its more radical tendency. Despite their differences, the two men could be broadly categorized as progressives in that they sought to bring about social reform through altering legal, regi legal regimes. Brown consciously aligned himself with Holmes by initially naming his congregation the Harlem, Unita Harlem Community Church. Alongside his Boston Universalist colleague, Clarence Skinner, Holmes had organized the community church movement to, in Skinner's words, create a free fellowship united for the study of universal religion, seeking apl to apply ethical ideas to individual life and the cooperative principle to all forms of social and economic life. In Holmes and Skinner's congregations, progressive and prefigurative ontologies were blended. Outside of congregational life, members worked diligently for social reform. Inside of the walls of the congregation, they sought to create the new church, which shall be the institutional embodiment of our new religion of democracy. 
drawing from the then popular social gospel, both men preached the need to substitute the individual for the social group as an object of salvation. This experience of social salvation was available on Sunday morning when peoples of every nationality and race, of every color and creed, became alike in worship and work. In such moments, the church instantiated the kingdom of God, the commonwealth of man, before it was present in the secular world. Under Holmes' leadership, the Community Church of New York was one of the earliest Unitarian congregations to meaningfully racially integrate. Its members, including Holmes himself, played important roles in founding the NAACP and the American Civil Liberties Union. As as a whole, the congregation served as a central organizing node for progressives and for the overlapping overlapping anti-war socialist and non-communist left well into the middle of the 20th century. Holmes was a supporter of the Harlem Community Church and a sometimes guest in its pulpit. Brown described his congregation in similar terms to the community church movement. He said it was dedicated to the service of humanity. As part of its work of service, alongside such Unitarian tropes as the cultivation of character, lay a commitment to struggle for the establishment of righteous social order, which shall bring about the abundance of life to man. Like Holmes and Skinner, Brown thought that religion and politics were inseparable. On more than one occasion, he ran for public office as a socialist, and for a few months in 1926, even worked as a paid speaker for the Socialist Party alongside his work as a pastor. He did not view the two positions as contradictory. Instead, when writing AUA President Samuel Elliott for financial support for his congregation, Brown told Elliott that his paid political position lent to the prestige necessary to the leader of a radical religious movement. This was no doubt in part because as a paid speaker, he was able to avoid working as an elevator operator, which is how he normally supported himself because financial support was denied by that same Samuel Elliott. But it was, due to, but it was also due to the greater exposure in the community for Unitarianism that his party work afforded him. Unfortunately, it seems that many Unitarians did not view Brown's connection to the Socialist Party the same way. He learned this when he solicited funds from white ministers for support for the Harlem congregation. At the time, Brown was the only black minister, and his congregation was the only Unitarian church where people of color made up the majority of members. Several several ministers wrote him of their own negative experiences trying to blend their commitment with socialism with their clerical vocations. Reflecting on the situation in the socialist publication, The New Leader, Brown feared that he was committing professional suicide and observed it is possible for a man to be a tolerant religious liberal and to be a bigoted, intolerant political conservative. Strange but true. Over the course of his career, Brown faced plenty of challenges from bigoted and intolerant white Unitarians. He received little support and often downright hostility from progressive white supremacists like AUA President Eliot, As a young man, Eliot described people of color as more nearly brutes, quote, than I have ever seen, and reflected, quote, they work best with a white man bossing them all the while. Later in life, Eliot served as a trustee for the Hampton Institute in Virginia, the vocational school for black people from which Booker T. Washington had graduated. By then, he appears to have adopted the political ontology of the previous generations of white supremacists progressives like his fellow Unitarians John Quincy Adams and Ralph Waldo Emerson. He rejected an innate belief in racial inferiority in favor of a claim that one of the primary impediments to racial equality was black culture, preaching in one sermon that Washington was right that when he said, skill, thrift, intelligence, and character are the fundamental things for the race to secure. The task, in his view, was to properly educate black people so that they could be assimilated into what he thought was the superior white culture. While Brown did not share Eliot's white supremacist views, he did hold the same progressive belief that education was the key to both personal and social development. At least a portion of the dispute between the Garveyites and progressives like Brown hinged upon this very understanding of how social reform happened. Like other populists, the Garveyites had an apocalyptic outlook. 
They believed that a cataclysmic race war would bring about a fundamental shift in human relations and the redemption of Africa. In the years immediately following World War I, Garvey claimed, quote, the handwriting on the wall shows that the bloodiest and greatest war of all times is yet to come. The war for global dominance was to be between Asia and Europe. Casting it in Darwinian terms, he argued that it was to be a battle for the survival of the fittest. This final conflict was to pit race against race. When the time came then, Garvey told his followers, we shall organize more than 400 million strong to float the banner of democracy on the great continent of Africa. He dreamed of all organizing all of Africa and the African diaspora into a single united people so that through the force of arms there might emerge Europe for the Europeans and Asia for the Asiatics and Africa for the Africans. It was a violent vision. And alongside violence, sovereignty lay near the center of this populist narrative. Because whites vastly outnumbered blacks in the United States, Garvey argued the only way that black people could achieve self-determination and political autonomy was by following the doctrine of going back to Africa. Unless they separated along racial lines, constituted a country of their own where they were given the fullest opportunity to develop politically, socially, and industrially, black people would remain under the thrall of white presidents, governors, mayors, congressmen, judges, and social and industrial leaders. Like other populists, Garvey imagined that the people he was attempting to create had clear boundaries. In his case, an essentialist interpretation of race led him to envision a pan-African diaspora that formed a coherent people, represented by the UNIA, and demarcated along biological lines. I believe in a pure black race, just as how, just as how all self-respecting whites believe in a pure white race, he wrote on one occasion. Brown critiqued Garvey on the futility of using violence against the better organized and better armed European powers then occupying Africa. In an article attacking UNIA, Brown observed, Garveyism aims to free Africa from European domination and to hand it over to Negroes for the establishment of a Negro Republic. This aim can only be accomplished through the force of arms. Garvey has not proved his seriousness of purpose by beginning to make preparations for this invasion of Africa. Brown's criticism was twofold. He objected to violence as a way to solve political disputes, a point underscored by his long-standing association with the pacifist homes, and he objected to Garvey's program as unrealistic. Unlike Garvey, Brown wrote little directly on the issue of sovereignty. This is not given, surprising given progressives' generally insufficient attention to the issue. Nonetheless, his thoughts on the matter can be gleaned from his sermons and public statements on state violence. He regularly spoke out against police brutality in sermons that were advertised in Harlem's newspapers. They had titles like, An Easter Dream, The Birth of a New Harlem, No Exploitation, No Mugging, No Police Brutality. At one point, he proposed the creation of the Society for the Prote Prevention of Police Brutality. Police Brutality. The mayor, sock them on the jaw. The police commissioner, shoot first and ask questions later. And his own, law must be administered in strict accordance with the law. He often paired his critique of police brutality with statements on the failure of law enforcement to protect Harlem residents from muggings. This underscored the way in which the police have historically enacted violence upon people of color in the name of protecting people from violence, even while failing to protect them from violence. Throughout, his message was consistent. The police have become brutal, defiant, insolent. Something definite must be done to curb these lawless officers of the law. Brown does not appear to have had a distinct idea of what that something definite was. His longest surviving text on the subject of state violence are not on police violence against people of color, but on state violence against political radicals. This might seem something surprising to a contemporary audience, but at the time, violence against political radicals was endemic. Anarchists, communists, socialists, and members of the ID courts and subjected to both judge-sanctioned and extrajudicial violence. To offer the single example of the IWW, 
by my own count, between 1905 and 1927, perhaps as many as 250 wobblies were lynched by vigilantes, executed by state officials, beaten to death by police guards, fatally denied medical treatment while in prison, or killed on the picket line by police officers and company guards. Alongside the dead, literally thousands of the union's members found themselves in jail, blacklisted, or evicted. Brown was particularly outraged by the execution of anarchists Sacco and Vanzetti. They were killed by the state of Massachusetts after a trial overseen by a judge who privately told another attorney, did you see what I did to those anarchistic bastards the other day? The Community Church of Boston served as a major center for organizing the Anarchist Defense Committee. Holmes was an advocate for them as well. As for Brown, he devoted an entire sermon to their memory and the injustice of the judicial system on the third year anniversary of their death. Striking what seemed like a contradictory pose, he argued, the courts of justice are our bulwark of democracy, even while noting that in their systematic imprisonment and punishment of political radicals, they have begun to show signs of infection and give forth the evidence of pollution. When he arrived at the subject of Sacco and Vanzetti, he let loose. Justice in America today is but a name, a farce, a travesty, travesty. Reminding his congregation that the two anarchists were far from the only labor or political radicals to be railroaded by the courts, he continued that judicial corruption was the greatest menace that threatened to transform our democracy into dust. In the face of this crisis, Brown did not propose abolition of the courts, the police, or the prisons. He never questioned the sovereignty or the legitimacy of the judicial system. To the question, who decides, he was willing to answer the judges, which really means the state. He fully endorsed the liberal political philosophy of equal rights, fully assured by impersonal, par, impartial, impartial and personal justice, without questioning why liberalism's commitments to such rights have never been realized for people of color. Instead, he mounted an argument familiar to many of his fellow progressives. The system needed to be purged of its corruptions, not fundamentally changed. He was, at best, vague on the details of how this transformation was to take place. He called for a revolution at the ballot box, even while many people of color did not have access to the right to vote, that would stave off the harms of another kind of revolution. Unless this happened and fear, fearless judiciary was put in place, he feared the deterioration of our courts contained the germs of the dissolution of the state itself. When it came to the legal system, Brown's position was shared by most of Garvey's critics. He was not the most outspoken of them. That honor belonged to the men clustered around the black socialist magazine, The Messenger. In 1922, Garvey's belief in the sovereignty of each race caused him to reach out to the populist white supremacist Ku Klux Klan in an effort to build cross -racial, a cross-racial alliance that would lead to black autonomy. The Klan was the ideological and sometimes also literal descendant of Jacksonian white supremacist populism, a tradition with which its members credited as laying the foundation, the broad foundation of universal white male suffrage. The imperial wizard was the titular head of the Ku Klux Klan. Garvey met with the imperial wizard and afterwards extended an invitation to the white supremacist to address UNIA's upcoming annual convention. Arguing that the Klan is the invisible government of the United States, Garvey reported to UNI's members that the Klan believes America to be a white man's country and also states that the Negro should have a country of his own in Africa. Though there's no evidence that the Klan leaders ever attended a UNI conf UNIA conference, Garvey's overtures to the white supremacist organization horrified progressive leaders. Du Bois called him a lunatic or a traitor and declared this open ally of the Ku Klux Klan should be locked up or sent home. The Messenger's editors and two of the NAACP's most prominent staff members promptly organized the Garvey Must Go campaign and sent a letter to the Attorney General demanding that the federal government do something about this menace to harmonious race relations. At a minimum, Brown implicitly endorsed Garvey must go. It's possible that he played a more active role in the campaign, 
though he does not appear to have been one of its organizers. Whatever the case, like other progressives, Brown was relieved when the federal government first jailed and then deported his fellow Jamaican. Garvey's propaganda was too good, and he was too popular with Harlem residents for Brown, Du Bois, Randolph, or any other progressive leader to combat without state intervention. UNIA hosted elaborate prefigurative rallies in which they acted as if they had already created Africa for Africans, dressed in robes of state, marched in formation, occupying the Harlem streets, and proclaimed themselves to be heads of the government of the African diaspora. These rallies attracted tens of thousands. Brown was lucky to get a couple of hundred people at his church. Overall, the episode, like the scuffle at Brown's church, was revealing of the limits of progressives' faith in moral suasion. I'll return briefly to the limits of moral suasion in my conclusion and then take up the matter to a much bigger, fuller extent in my third lecture. For now, before leaving Brown, I should tell you that despite his popularity in Harlem, Brown was a marginal figure of the, in the Unitarianism of his day. Progressive white supremacists like AUA President Samuel Eliot helped to ensure his position on the edges of organized Unitarianism. They denied his requests for financial support and only begrudgingly recognized his standing as a Unitarian minister, despite his degree from Meadville Theological School and his steadfast commitment to Unitarian theology. In recent years, his importance to both Unitarian Universalism and theology as a whole has grown. Despite leaving no full book text behind, he is now seen as a foundational figure in the tradition of black humanism, which, citing Juan Floyd Thomas, Norman Allen Jr., and Anthony Pinn in turn, might be variously described as a redirection of the faith in the work of human heads and hands rather than heavenly help to resolve the problems of the world, a rational, human-centered life stance that is primarily concerned with life here and now, and black self-control, self-assertion, and concern for human fam the human family without a conscious discussion of this assertion's impact on traditional conceptions of divinity or ultimate reality. Whatever the price defini precise definition, a study of Garvey and the Garveyite movement reveals that Brown's dispute with him was over political ontology, not theology. Brown, Garvey himself developed a Christology that blended Unitarianism and organic Universalism. In a series of speeches, he declared, Christ was not black, Christ was not white, Christ was not completely red, Christ was the embodiment of all humanity, explained that each race must have a Jesus that looked like them, and called for black people to worship the black man of sorrows. William Ferris, literary editor of the Negro World, also published in the newspaper's pages humanistic sentiments that could have passed for Brown's own words when he wrote such passages as, the black man needs to get his reward here and now rather than wait for it in heaven. In contrast to Brown, the Anglo-American Francis Greenwood Peabody was a central figure in early 20th century Unitarianism and the progressive movement. He belonged to an earlier generation than Brown, Born into the Unitarian elite of the middle 19th century, he graduated from Harvard College, Harvard Divinity School, studied theology in Germany, and served for six years as minister of First Parish in Cambridge before returning to Harvard as a professor in 1880. For many years, like his cousin, AUA President Samuel Eliot, he also served as a trustee for the Hampton Institute. Remembered in part for his champion of the introduction of Germans, the German social sciences into American universities, Peabody, alongside his friend William James, taught, an entire, taught the generation that was to be the base of the progressive movement. At Harvard Divinity School, he educated hundreds of Unitarian ministers, including John Haynes Holmes, while developing the theological discipline of social ethics. His method was to view, in, view problems of individual morality through a social lens, an approach that led his students to jokingly rename his most popular course, Peabody's Drainage, Drunkenness, and Divorce. Peabody was the last in the lineage of Harvard moral philosophy that stretched back to Henry Ware's 1805 acquisition of the Hollis Chair of Divinity for religious liberals. The tradition emphasized ethics over metaphysics and might be encapsulated in a statement by one of its adherents. A man is not a Christian in proportion to the amount of truth 
he puts into a creed, but in proportion to the amount of truth he puts into life. Harvard Unitarianism was principally the religion of an elite that functioned as a mercantile oligarchy and controlled the university, most of the city of Boston, and the majority of Massachusetts's state government. Historian Daniel Walker Howe has described it as offering an instructive example of a patrician class giving responsible leadership to its community. While many 19th century Unitarians were ambivalent about the role of the state in social reform, it was an essentially progressive movement. Its proponents, proponents believed in the power of education to slowly transform society and held that the moral elite essentially functioned as the conscience of society. Peabody taught at the university when it was still dominated by Unitarians, and with his brother-in-law, Harvard President Charles Eliot, he played a pivotal role in transforming both the college and the divinity school into non-Unitarian institutions. He helped shift the divinity school away from its sectarian role as a training ground for Unitarian ministers and to a non-denominational school for theology. He also ended compulsory chapel attendance for undergraduates, believing, quote, compulsion towards religion in the life of, the, of youth has bred repulsion from religion in the life of many a man. No less a figure than Ralph Waldo Emerson opposed the abolition of mandatory chapel attendance. Peabody, however, won the day and was able to success, successfully argue for volunteerism, believing that, rational, re, that religion rationally presented can hold its place among the competing interests of the time. This volunteeristic approach to religion pervaded Peabody's progressive political ontology. He thought that social ethics began from cooperative action that was innate in human nature. He rooted this urge to cooperate in his belief that following the doctrine of St. Paul, we are members of one another. Where populists saw a divided humanity consisting of separate peoples and threatened by elites, Peabody saw an organic whole. The principal task was to educate people to accept and perform their role as best as possible. This approach to ethics came from an understanding that, Christ, that of Christianity that could be distilled as the belief that the religion of Jesus is a religion of education. In his classrooms, he taught that social ethics itself was an elite enterprise because concerns about social justice only emerged when society neared the best condition. At such a point, individuals began to realize that underneath all the extraordinary achievements of modern civilization, there lies a burdening so sense of social maladjustment, there lie uh, the social question. Ultimately, he believed that social problems were fundamentally moral problems, address people's moral shortcomings, and eventually the whole of society's problems will be solved. He encapsulated his theology. The beginning is individual, the aim is social. The way to make a world good is, first of all, to be good oneself. First character, then charity. First life, then love. He built off of this foundation in a sermon he preached at Harvard where he instructed his student, students on how to think about problems of capitalism. Turning to a biblical illustration, he told them, Cain was the first philosophical individualist, the first laissez-faire economist. It is Cain's theory that causes trouble today. Where is thy brother, says God to the businessman? Thy brother, the wage earner, the victim of the cut down and the lockout. When faced with a social problem, Peabody looked not to tensions unearthed through a study of political economy, uh, but to, though, to where the moral fault lie. The fault was always found in those who looked to themselves first and the larger community second. As such an attitude might suggest, like earlier generations of Harvard Unitarians, Peabody was something of a social conservative. His greatest hope was for the creation of a stable civilization in which the needs of all would be taken care of through judicious charity. In such a world, social hierarchy would remain largely intact. What he called the social question was really an attempt to harmonize liberty with law, emancipation with organization, and living growth with stable form. Like many of his Unitarian predecessors, Peabody's desire for stability was tied to the variety of assimilationist white supremacy often linked to progressive political ontologies. 
In his major text, Jesus Christ and the Social Question, he argued for a version of imperialism that would bring, quote, the blessings of a Christian civilization on a heathen world. Rather than objecting to conquest, he pleaded that the annexation of Guam, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico following the Spanish-American War and the annexation of Hawaii should be judged on the, quote, moral quality of the conquest itself. He thought that bringing supposedly inferior nations under the control of the United States would allow them to progress to the evolutionarily higher state he imagined was present in his own country. His attitude towards African Americans followed much the same tact. Peabody viewed his work with the Hampton Institute as, quote, a spiritual enterprise and a form of missionary service. The task of enlightened whites like himself was to train, quote, a backward race for citizenship. Consistent with earlier generations of white supremacist progressives, he argued against the innate biological inferiority of black people, noting that they had qualities from which a firm civilization could be built. The key was education. Properly applied to them, to help, it would help them advance economically, politically, and socially, well, leading them away from an unstable and intermittent piety into an irrational and ethical faith, his own Unitarianism. Peabody mixed his progressivism with a prefigurative ontology. Over and against other theologians who emphasized apocalyptic readings of the Christian New Testament, Peabody argued the kingdom of God is within you. In words that paralleled the Russian anarchist Leo Tolstoy, Peabody wrote, the kingdom is described as both a present and a future state, as both an inward and an outward condition. Rejecting the image of Jesus as someone teaching that a radical break in human history was imminent, Peabody instead emphasized that his teaching of the kingdom meant the moral, that the moral life was available in the here and now. Whenever confronted with the gospel texts that seemed to confront his chosen reasoning of Christianity's central figure, he applied a basic hermeneutic. The more spiritual and ethical the teaching is, the more likely it is to come from the teacher's lips. Just as progressivism caused him to question the calls for revolution by populism, his biblical hermeneutics caused him to question Jesus's apocalypticism. Peabody's progressivism was also evident in his commitment to empiricism. Progressivism has been described as based in an epistemology of experience and the belief that philosophical ideas are to be judged by their historical impact rather than, quote, metaphysical or ideological doctrine. Peabody argued that if social ethics didn't help guide individuals and by extension communities in making the right choices, then it was use as useless as moral philosophy which frequently left its practitioners, quote, powerless when confronting a specific moral problem. In his classrooms, he introduced a case method that was inspired by the one practiced in the law school. His desire for social peace and his understanding of the role education played in reform come into clear focus in the case of labor unions, especially when contrasted with the populist industrial workers of the world. The IWW was and is a radical labor union organized around the theory that the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. Union members believe that a struggle must go on between these classes until it is ultimately resolved. This will come when a single people is fashioned from the workers of the world and they then unite to take possession of the means of production. Peabody's solution to labor conflict was to advocate for workers' cooperatives and workers' moral education. In his view, workers' cooperatives were inherently prefigurative. If they were, if they were but created and supported, they would eventually lead to a situation where industry would be administrated, stirred from a single center and for the sake of all. This transition to a post-capitalist economy was to be a gradual, evolutionary, and peaceful process. He described it in theological terms that were grounded in his understanding of the kingdom of God. He wrote, a few plain people associate themselves into a cooperative enterprise, quite unconscious that they are in anywhere, any degree bearing witness to the social principles of the gospel. They apply themselves to the simple problem of conducting a shop or factory with fidelity, self-sacrifice, and patience. And as their work expands, they seem to themselves to have made a good commercial venture. While, in fact, in one corner of the great industrial world, 
that are illustrating the principle of the Christian religion that industrial progress begins from within. In order to help workers move forward in this process of creating workers' cooperatives, Peabody recommended the formation of centers for workers' education. He helped found one himself in Cambridge. Its stated goal was education for oneself, fraternity for one's neighbor, good citizenship for the common welfare. The relationship between Peabody's perspective on labor relations and social peace is found in the critique he leveled against the IWW on the eve of his retirement from Harvard. In, 19, in 1912, immigrant textile workers in nearby Lawrence, Massachusetts, called on the Wobblies to lead a strike for higher wages. In the resulting conflict, the union united workers from 40 different nationalities and across almost as many languages. Union leader Big Bill Haywood recalled it as the greatest strike that has ever been carried out in this country or in any other country. Its glory was not to be found in its size or effectiveness. Rather, it came from the way it prefigured the kind of world the Wobblies wanted to see created. Haywood wrote, it was a democracy. The strikers handled their own affairs. There was no president of the organization. There was no one the boss could see except the strikers. The committee instantiated the union's vision of a globally united working class that would, could come together and defeat capitalism. At the same time, Haywood told a reporter that its action of uniting the roughly 25,000 workers who toiled in Lawrence's textiles mills should be understood as a new kind of violence, the havoc we raise with money by laying down our tools. This new kind of violence was not the only violence present during the strike. The police killed the striker and immigrant Anna Lupizo while she was walking a picket line. In the wake of her death, Peabody equivocated the violence that resulted in her death and the Wobblies' new kind of violence, which was really a path-breaking form of nonviolent direct action. In, a published essay, excuse me, in an unpublished essay, he blamed the strike equally on the mill owner's failure to deal with the employed as human beings and the professional agitators of the IWW. He felt that none of the parties were rational. Neither the mill owners nor the mill workers understood the, quote, delicate mechanisms of economics. The conflict that had erupted between them, two of them, or between them could have been avoided if they underwent a moral reformation and were properly educated on the finer points of social reform. What was needed was the strengthening of the connection between liberal education and modern life. In his analysis, he also made a frequent comp uh, complaint that progressives frequently level against populists, calling the strike those riots in Lawrence. He blamed the blind masses for falling under the sway of a very clever leader. Overall, the re essay reflected his belief that movements based on, quote, reform and discontent were fundamentally oppositional to order, patience, and restraint. Peabody could have had another response. Other religious liberals of his generation were taken by the prefigurative spirit they sensed in the strike, rather than its violence. Henry Emerson Fosdick described the strikers as conscious of a solidarity that overpasses all differences of color, nationality, and speech. He also believed that they joined the union because its spirit, not because of its ideology. As a pastor, he recognized that this was similar to why some men joined the church. For his part, John Haynes Holmes uh, praised the strikers as our living brothers and commended those who fought a brave fight in Lawrence. He also criticized those who preferred abstract principles to the concrete, suggesting that progressives who preferred social peace to social justice were more committed to otherworldly metaphysics than they might be willing to admit. However confused Peabody's desire for social peace might have might have left him on the role of violence and social struggle, he had nothing directly to say about sovereignty. To the extent that his views on the subject can be reconstructed, they suggest that he believed the United States and the world were best ruled by an enlightened elite. In this view, he was little different from many white supremacist populists who thought that the United States was a white man's republic and were committed, in their own words, to the hegemony of a single race with a common civilization. They believe, as he seems to have, that some humans were fit to rule while others were not. Peabody made his distinction upon educational lines. The white supremacists made theirs upon racial lines. Such a position should not be unexpected. 
The progressive belief that education is a key to social reform can easily transmute into a belief that the educated are the ones best equipped to rule. Not all progressives are willing to admit to such a view, though Peabody certainly did. Progressives like Brown are also frequently confused about the role violence plays in po politics. Social peace might be a desirable goal, but elides the reality that the construction of a political community, political community, be it a people as populists would prefer or a reform state as progressives generally desire, is often a bitter contest between differing actors. It is a mistake to imagine that moral suasion will always carry the day. Social groups cannot reconcile their differences otherwise. And while they are often loath to admit it, many progressives rely upon the violence of the state to create the conditions necessary for political debate. This is seen in Brown's tacit support of Gar the Garvey Must Go campaign. It's also apparent in Peabody's overt, overt support of imperialism, which he thought would bring civilization to heathens, and his unstated approval of the police. In his writing on the Lawrence strikes, he blames both the strikers and the employers for the violence that erupted during the labor struggle. Not once does he point his finger, um, not once does he point his finger at the individual who actually killed Anna Loprizo, a police officer. Not once does he consider that the force of the state, the force of the state played a crucial role in determining the outcome of the strike. As for the question of sovereignty, progressives rarely have a clear answer on this subject either. Brown did not. He simultaneously appealed to and denounced the courts. He ultimately relied upon a judicial system to remove his greatest political enemy, all the way making appeals to the power of moral suasion. In Peabody's case, his position is akin to the meritocratic arguments made by many progressives today. These arguments often fuel the growth of populist movements directly. They feed narratives that it is an educated elite rather than a people who should rule. I'll take up these issues of sovereignty and violence in greater depth in my third and final lecture, where I'll turn from historical actors to contemporary events. There, I will examine the potential a blending of prefigurative, progressive, and populist ontologies might offer for confronting the crises of the hour the climate, climate catastrophe, the rejuvenation of white, supremacist, popu white supremacist populism, and the dissolution of democracy. Beginning with the discussion of the events in Charlottesville, Virginia, I will ask what Unitarian Universalists are being called to do today. I'll speculate on how living into this call will require clearer thinking about the relation between the state and violence, how it will necessitate a confrontation with the white supremacist elements frequently tied to progressive ontology, and how, it might, and how we must look to the voices and movements on the margins to form a new sovereignty that could allow for the creation of a new multiracial, multicultural, multilingual, and multitudinous people that embodies something of what we might call our new religion of democracy, the beloved community, or even the kingdom of God. But for now, I bid you good night and thank you for your attention. I'm going to invite Dr. Pin up, and I'm also going to say that if for a moment you all, as you are able, would like to stand, remind yourself that you have a body. Years ago, I did an April Fool's newsletter column that said that the back pews were going to be replaced by Barco loungers. Got me in huge trouble, but I bet right about now, you're wishing that were the case. So stretch, feel yourself back in your body. Take a deep breath as we take everything in tonight. And the chart blue of the sunset uh, changes the color of our, of our windows. Take it all in. And then let's be seated and listen to our respondent for the night. And then we will gather for a reception afterwards. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm really, really happy to be here with you. Um, before I provide my uh, response, let me give you a bit of context. Uh, Dr. Boston and I 
uh, met some years ago, but it's only been more recently that we've had an opportunity to really chat over the course of a monthly lunch. We've uh, discussed a variety of issues, and we, with great collegiality, have disagreed on some of those issues and agreed on others. But it's always been with an intent for both of us to grow, to gain perspective, and to exercise opportunity. And that remains the case tonight. What I really want to do is highlight a couple of things. One, I want to highlight the material circumstances that Colin outlines, and outlines with respect to roughly a 100-year period. From 1928, with Brown getting a beat down, to Donald Trump. Um, and I want to use that as a way of thinking through what Colin proposes with respect to a shift in our political understandings and political opportunities, a way of being in the world, um, but also the social ethics that that sort of move necessitates. And I want to think about those again in light of the circumstances and with respect to two frameworks, one mood and the other movement. By mood, I mean to indicate attention to the underlying optimism in Collins' paper and raise the question, in light of the tenacious circumstances we have encountered, the deep and abiding anti-black racism, what level of optimism is justified? S secondly, movement. As I read Colin, I think in terms of social ethics that is concerned with a particular starting point, that starting point being the problem we must address. But I propose, and again, based upon the circumstances, if we might not need to shift that starting point, that point of movement away from the problem that needs to be solved to the failure of our efforts. And I raise the question of the failure of our efforts in light of both Brown and Garvey. And so please don't read me as rejecting the possibility of social ethics and rejecting the possibility of transformation, but wanting to linger over the hardship to take seriously the circumstances and raise the question in a way that is Sisyphean in nature, think about that stone rolling back down to raise the question concerning proper framing of social ethics in light of what we encounter in the world, to modify optimism to the extent that circumstances require. Yeah? All right. Collins' insightful lecture highlights a period historian Gayroyd Wilmore identifies in terms of the black church's de-radicalization. And he frames this in terms of the death of a central figure, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He passes away in 1915, outside of the United States. But this is what's important about Henry McNeil Turner. In 1895, in Atlanta, Georgia, the same year that Booker T. Washington gives his famous or infamous speech, depending on your perspective, in which he calls for economic unity but accepts social distinction. When it comes to the economic well-being of the United, of United States, we are united like the hand, but when it comes to social issues, we are as separate as the fingers. He's fine with that. In the same year, in the same location, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner argues, God is a Negro. 18, 1915, he passes away in 1895 in Atlanta, Georgia, he argues, God is a Negro. And he suggests that any group of people that doesn't worship a God that looks like them is a population of blockheads, and they get what they deserve. 
right, that he argues that African Americans are the only civilized group who worship a God who looks nothing like them. They go to church and they worship a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus, a God who looks nothing like him. And he argued that they cannot make progress until they recognize their direct link to divinity. For him, this is a call to rethink theological anthropology in a way that allows black people to understand that they rightfully occupy time and space. This is the gentleman who also argued, until the United States does right by black people, its flag is a dirty rag. He says this in the Deep South. In more recent years, just kneeling will lose you your job. Imagine what this could have cost him. But he argued the flag is a dirty rag until the United States does right by black people. He dies in 1915, and Gayward Wilmore says, mm, this marks the end of a certain type of black church, with the possible exception of a couple of figures, one of them being another AME, Reverdy C. Ransom, the socialist who, who is all about the business of transforming the world, that the church is a base for doing this, and that anyone's who has a theology that is not committed to the world, hasn't gotten their hands dirty, and really ought to rethink the label Christian. So there's Reverend e. Ransom, and there's Ida B. Wells, and other black church figures who offer a theology informed by social critique, yet black churches are overwhelmingly shifting due to the pressures of socioeconomic transformation that marks the Great Migration, African Americans moving in large numbers, overwhelming these churches. They just cannot respond to the need. And so many of these churches, rather than rethinking resource, turn inward. It's not about transforming material circumstances. It's about getting right with God. It's not about securing proper homes and securing educational opportunities and jobs that allow you to thrive. It's about getting your soul right. With black churches privileging spiritual renewal, activism found a home in organizations marked by a creative metaphysical push, perhaps most forcefully presented in religious and quasi-religious developments in Harlem, USA. Now, framed by both pessimism regarding traditional patterns of meaning making, but also optimism tied to a sense of engagement with the world uh, that could result in the transformation of our ways of being, Garvey attempted to reshape black self-understanding and presentation through a praxis of robust being, a hermeneutic of geographic excellence and an aesthetic of substance, all meant to reposition African Americans. During the same period, but resisting Garvey's black nationalism, Brown advocates for race-sensitive and US-centric rationalism, expressed as a liberal religious impulse having capacity to re-envision both private and public life. Colin has told us this. Yet, embattled by the sensibilities of the time, the organizing of this rationalism involved compromise with white disregard a modification of expectations so as to keep alive some sense of possibility. And the UNIA's pro-black ethos is a surrender of connection to a land built with black hands and watered through blood in exchange for the uncertain possibility of a new arrangement of sociopolitical and economic life. In a word, what the religious theological shifts in their political connotations highlight and tells a theologized wrestling with the Negro problem. As depicted by W.E.B. Du Bois in the souls of black folk, it's a matter of shared geography within a cultural framework of exclusion. Although that book offers no lasting resolution to this problem, every possibility outlined in that book, political engagement, economic opportunity, the black church, all of the possibilities ultimately fail. He offers no resolution. It does highlight the fundamental significance of the color line for understanding the 20th century. And tied to this color line is the double consciousness that defines the metaphysics of black being, undergirded as it is by an implicit reckoning with enlightenment notions of the human. Colin posits political ontology as the means by which various political agents attempt to constitute the political 
And I would add, it also entails how those agents are themselves constituted. Hence, there is an underlying issue needing explicit attention. Any political ontology, or more generally, any way of being political, might collapse under the weight of a larger ontological issue. To the extent anti-black racism denies the humanity of African Americans, it renders them incapable of being political. This constitutes a fundamental framing of sovereignty as tied to the nature and meaning of the human in the United States that excludes racialized populations by projecting them as enemy to be contained, controlled, eliminated. One might say the state doesn't merely have a relationship to violence in these circumstances, but instead it constitutes a form of violence. Such a statement highlights a possibility haunting the political. It is always and already marred by disregard. Colin describes these dynamics in relationship to populism in the age of Trump, but they could just as easily be discussed as a fascist impulse given expression and voice through a rabid white supremacy. The idea of the United States is a mechanism of systemic disregard with boundaries formed and enforced through othering. I would not say this if I could point to Trump as an oddity a wart on US democracy, but it seems to me what Trump represents is a more graphic continuation of a long process of disregard. In this context, just in crude form. When thought together within the Harlem environment, Brown and Garvey speak a black humanism, qua a black inflected metaphysics of collective life. And their political language and categories are earthy to the extent they are grounded in the material substance and conditions of Jim Crow America. It's a black humanism requiring reconfiguration of whiteness as an ontology, that is whiteness as a mode of being in the world that consumes all other modes of being, a type of predatory ontology. This whiteness reflects a particularly persistent mode of violence as the structuring of life and Colin hopes to address this when saying, if Unitarian Universalists and other religious leftists are to be effective in either, to quote Mark Hicks, building the world we dream about, or resisting white supremacist populism of Trump regime, then we must move beyond progressive political ontology, imagine new ways of being political, and come up with clear understandings of our relationships to sovereignty and the state's relationship to violence. Collins' statement suggests an underlying assumption the human can position herself so as to promote social justice or at least well-being. Yet, for the sake of argument, I wonder, do current circumstances and their clear tie to a longer history of white supremacy's explicit dismissal of so-called others in progressive and conservative circles justify the ethical move Colin begins to call for in his lecture. My goal in raising this question is not to dismiss his argument. No, I find it compelling in a variety of ways. Rather, my aim is to extend conversation by pointing out challenges to new strategies for being political so as to encourage a deeply material sensibility which undercuts easy answers, affording no sustained attention to the depth of disregard that affects collective US life. If my depiction of existential circumstances has any merit at all, we need to reconsider an ethical outlook concerned with successful transformation bar marked by an outcome-driven logic. What would it mean for social ethics to take seriously and foreground the failure of Brown and Garvey. What I want to briefly suggest here is a shift in perspective because the type of social ethics Colin envisions might require emphasizing a particular dimension of the point of departure, not the problem of political forms, but of activism's failure. This is not to suggest Colin is, isn't concerned with history as examining, examination of our shortcomings or failures. No, I'm suggesting the value in highlighting these failures as the point of departure for ethics. Such then is a shift in social ethics, what ought we do as reflection not on the problem of what we want 
for the world over against the modalities of injustice most pernicious to us, but rather on what our best efforts have failed to accomplish over and over and over. In the context of Collins' lecture, this would entail attention not to Brown and Garvey's agenda, but rather the manner in which the politics of white supremacy topples their organizing. Brown's effort isn't supported by liberal religion, at least in part due to racially-based inconsistency guided by anti-black racism. Garvey falls victim to the political mood, anti-black and dismissive in nature. Brown, although defeated in certain ways, remains in the United States, but Garvey can only be addressed through a purge, physical removal. Neither, in a sense, are able to offer new ways of being political, capable of shifting the long-standing racial dynamics and violent impulse in the United States. Again, what does it mean to attempt the world we dream about, or at the very least resist white supremacist populism of the Trump regime, as Colin frames it. As I've argued elsewhere, one of my teachers, one of my mentors, ethicist Sharon Welsh, notes there is no foundation for ethics and moral action that guarantees individuals and groups will act in productive and liberating ways or that they will ultimately achieve their objectives. Therefore, activity is risky, it's dangerous, because it requires operating without the certainty and security of a clearly articulated product. Ethical action concerns an indeterminate wrestling over both language and materiality. In wrestling over language, ethics might highlight the fragility of discursive constructions that oppress, exposing them as non-essential structures of meaning that can be challenged, for example, the fiction of the human as a distinct and white independent actor over against the world. With respect to materiality, this Welsh-informed perspective concerns itself with lucidity regarding the context for life, awareness. Such an ethical system recognizes struggle takes place from within systems that we both resist and support. It understands human relationships with self, other, and world are messy, inconsistent, and thick with contradictory desires and motives. This is a somewhat less hopeful approach, but it has a clearer sense of how life's relationships work within our socio-cultural geographies of experience. It demands a measured, historically borne out sense of what can be achieved based on the nature and meaning of embodied selves in an inhospitable world. And so, with respect to Collins' effort to project new ways of being political, either historically sensitive but presentist in nature, can such effort be fruitful? Well, better than an answer, perhaps it's useful to imagine ethical rebellion against injustice as being its own reward. Thank you. So we thought we would just have a, a opportunity for a couple of questions, just 10 minutes at the most. It's really mostly to see how much you understood. One, two, one, two. No, I'm just kidding. Would anyone, so is anyone here who'd like to ask? So um, I'm going to have to ask you to come to the mic for, we have mic. Uh, oh, we have one. Oh, great. Thank you, Jonathan. Great. If you can bring it. I'm going to take the liberty to just sort of oh, yeah. say a few off-the-cuff things in response to Tony. Um, I think I, I like the sort of uh, mood and movement dynamic that you make, and I'm thinking about this question of optimism, because I don't generally think of myself as particularly optimistic when it comes to these questions of ethics or social... Um, movements, I tend to think of myself as uh, rooted in particular places of despair and trying to figure out how to move forward from them, and that uh, 
there's a sort of like, I can't go on, I'll go on sort of sense, sensibilities that I carry. So I'm really interested in this kind of like uh, description of me as an optimist. Like it's sort of like a, a sense that maybe the world could be better and that that's um, uh, what you're pointing out. Like maybe we just should say, no, maybe it's not going to get uh, better, certainly from the perspective of anti-black violence in the United States and a long continuous history of that, there's lots of questions as to whether like optimism is of any kind is warranted or social progress is warranted. Um, and I, I guess the honest truth is I'm still figuring my way through that, those kind of questions. I think one uh, reason why I've always been attracted to what I've called prefigurative ontology is it tries to escape the um, future orientation of opt optimism and instead suit uh, substitute some kind of immediate lived experience. So I've um, been very influenced by the anarchist thinker Haikun Bey and his idea of the temporary autonomous zone where the world is so full of despair and so like you're not ever going to achieve any kind of like freedom outside of uh, because because the ontological situation you're in is so bad, but you can perhaps achieve it in a small space briefly, right? And so he has this wonderful um, example at the end of the book where he says, shall we not admit that a dinner party has more reality than the entire US government, if only for an evening? Which is to say that like, we're always negotiating and creating this sort of political reality and uh, um, constituting it. So that's, that's just kind of my off-the-cuff, like, thinking about it. See, we're getting a little taste of their lunches. <laughs> so, that, yeah, good. Just, just quickly, where I sense the optimism. That one, I sense the optimism with respect to um, your embrace of this idea regarding the worlds we dream. Uh -huh. well, within that, it's, I, I sense an assumption that these worlds we dream are in some way, shape, or form better than. Mm -hmm. They are, yeah. in, in some way, shape, or form, they pull us out of the messiness, the nastiness. Yeah. Um, and that our activity has something to do with our ability to achieve something that constitutes better. Yeah. For me, that's optimistic. Yeah. And, and particularly in, in, in light of how you frame this roughly 100 year right. period. There is no outside with respect to misery. Okay, yeah. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've been thinking not so much about. Uh, Jackson is, is an early marker of American racism, but thinking about uh, Bacon's Rebellion and the Virginia race laws and how they um, served to divide and conquer that, that early um, alliance between white indentured servants and, and African slaves. And thinking about how the, 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 the racism that came from that uh, and the white supremacy that came from that served not only to oppress African, African Americans, but also served to oppress poor whites mm -hmm. because that eliminated their political power. You know, they got to keep their shirt on while they were getting whipped, you know. So thinking about that and thinking about how, you know, it's easy for me as a progressive to look at Trump supporters and say, you know, you're being, you're being fooled. Trump really isn't on your side. He's using your call to white supremacy and your sense of victimhood to um, to uh, trick you into supporting him, who who is not interested in giving you power or or, or or anything. But then thinking about that again from the progressive side and thinking of that as a Unitarian. Mm -hmm and thinking about our tendency to believe in a um, intellectual meritocracy that uh, you know, we're, we're enlightened, we, we want the best for the world, but are still not involved in creating class power 
for people who are the victims of white supremacy and the victims of of class structures that uh, that oppress them. I'm trying to disentangle the question because that seems more of a comment, but um, I think if I were to just sort of say like the if the question is like so why Jacksonian populism rather than Bacon's Rebellion, if that's the question, like why start there? Um, that I chose that point because that's a sort of self-identified point for Trump and his cohort of people, right? And you can go much further back and make sort of different conversations about um, the construction of race and whether, you know, is the Jacksonian moment different than previous moments um, or not. Uh, I think that it's, um, and it's, I think it's an open question on some level whether it is different, but the thing that's interesting about it to me, well, there's two things. One is it's very consciously self-identified by Donald Trump. He has a portrait of Andrew Jackson moved into the Oval Office. He gave a speech, which is a horrifying read, um, on the uh, 250th anniversary of Jackson's uh, birth at his birthplace. Um, and that it's also a moment where uh, I, I would argue that um, what I'm calling white supremacist populists, but certainly people like John Quincy Adams and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Margaret Fuller are trying to draw a distinction between themselves and, uh, and Andrew, Andrew, Andrew Jackson and populists. And I think that it's interesting because I think that like in terms of the question of failure, I don't think that they do. I think that they're actually just sort of they like they were involved and are sitting on land where all of the native, not all, where many of the indigenous folks were killed and their lands were expropriated from 200 years ago. So it's no longer sort of the same issue for them, and so they feel like they have the ability to sort of cast stones at the southern Jacksonians, um, and so it brings out a lot of these sort of questions of like you know, whose side is who on, and like, is there really a difference between progressivism and populism when it comes to issues of like white supremacy? Um, so that was, yeah. Right. Rose, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I guess as I'm listening to both of you, I am searching in vain for an intersectional look at this period. There are no women in this story mm -hmm. that I can find. And I'm trying to figure out whether or not you struggled in your respective work about how to look at what was happening to women in this period. There's a club women's movement going on. Mm -hmm. There's a suffrage movement going on. And I'm just trying to figure out how that figured into the work that either of you have done around this period. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that for me, uh, you know, this is one lecture looking at two figures. And so, in sort of the larger body of my work, I talk a lot about Amy Jacques Garvey. I talk a lot about um, the women member of the Garvey movement and sort of their relationship to that suffragette. I talk, I uh, frame sort of progressivism in many ways in relationship to the passage of the suffrage movement and how people view this as like a real moment of social turning. Um, you know, it's, I think it's a struggle to do everything in one uh, lecture and um, yeah, and so. I wasn't trying to make you account for that in yeah. a single lecture. Yeah. I was just trying to get a sense of, and in the sweep of your work, how that, how yeah. the look at women fits into it. Yeah, and I guess the other thing I would say that one of the things that uh, I did not talk about here, but again talk about elsewhere, is that populism as a political ontology does have a sort of strongly male gendered element to it. And so um, you can find like, women who are in populist movements and leading populist movements even, but like 
in general, it's an overwhelmingly masculine movement, in part because at least most populists are interested in sort of constructing, I mean, the title of the first lecture is A White Man's Republic, because the Jacksonian populists are interested in constructing a white male subject. So I love the question. I'd like to think about it in terms of two areas of my work. So one in terms of religious history, but the other uh, theological approach to black humanism. And this period, the kind of emergence of the Harlem Renaissance, right, and the kind of energy of the Harlem Renaissance, it's impossible for me to kind of think about the development of black humanism as a counter theology without figures like Nella Larson, right? Her book, Quicksand, is brilliant, and it doesn't surprise me that it doesn't receive more attention because it leaves, I, I don't know if you've read it or not. If you have not read it, you need to put it on your summer reading list, and you will send me an email thanking me for this. It is a brilliant text in which it wrestles with this fundamental question of human suffering, right? It's this theological and philosophical question, and she tackles it without flinching. What can you say about God in light of human suffering in the world? And ultimately in this text, she says nothing. You can say nothing, right? It is a brilliant text, so wrestling with her, and it's impossible to do work on black humanism and these alternate theological platforms without someone like Zora Neale Hurston for whom prayer is for the weak-minded, right? And within these texts, you get this kind of deep and sympathetic read of the religious landscape of, of black America in ways that looks beyond the black church, but what these religious opportunities offer at the end of the day do very little to end violence against black women, yeah? Do very little to change the class dynamics, right? So on that level, my work with respect to these theological trends in black humanism is deeply indebted to these sorts of figures. In terms of religious history, it's the, the presence of black women offers the most profound critique, Right, that black, if you take the black church, for example, you might be able to argue that it's done noteworthy work with respect to issues of anti-black racism, but has been woefully inadequate on every other social issue. Right, that you don't have within the context of most black churches, you don't have black women being ordained into the mid 20th century. The African Methodist Episcopal Church, the oldest black denomination in the country, it's a denomination as of 1816, the leader of this denomination, when he is confronted by a black woman who everybody says sure enough can preach, right? Has the gifts. Jarena Lee has the gifts, says nothing about her discipline calls for this. It's not until the mid 20th century that black women are ordained in this denomination. And it's not until the emergence of the 20, right? It's not until we move beyond that period that we get the first black woman being ordained a bishop within these times. And so we have a growth in terms of black women holding pastorates in the AME church and other denominations, but let's look at the size of those congregations. Are those bishop forming congregations? No, those are get a second job congregations, right? So there are ways in which the, the absence of black women becomes the major point of conversation with respect to this religious history. And then you get figures like Paula Murray, who's not in a traditional black church, right? But she is, you don't have womanist thought without Pauli Murray. She is first to argue that you've got to link these issues of race and gender, and you've got to address them theologically, right? That for her, the theology did not make any sense. What King was doing did not make any sense. What James Cone was doing, and J.D. Otis Roberts and these others did not make any sense until they brought in, in a central way, the issue of gender. And, and so my work on Pauli Murray has also helped me to kind of rethink the landscape of uh, black religious history. So I think we could go on like this for a while, but I think you too also probably could use a piece of cheesecake and a <laughs> glass of something in reward for uh, all the mental energy we have just uh, enjoyed, but you have expended. So first of all, I'd like us all to thank um, Dr. Boston and Dr. Pin for tonight.
and thank the men's committee and Bill as its representative, and Rose and I both for Star King and uh, First UU Society, and all of you for being here and those who helped make the reception welcoming and gorgeous, um, which we will all now go and enjoy. So, blessings. Let's take this food and that food and go out into the world.